Salutations, my friends, and welcome back to TNO playing with Glenn, in which we are trying to shoot for the stars, but things are not looking super good right now. But how much is this going to cost? What in the world do these plants run on? Are you burning hundred dollar bills? Did you make all the handles out of gold? Why the heck are these nuclear reactors so gosh darn expensive? The Democrat Senator bellowed face red from anger. They are so gosh darn expensive because they are, President Glenn replied, maintaining his ice-cold nerves. Turns out flying jet fighters and going to space have done a lot to make him calm and collected in everyday life or so when you were president, basing off a bunch of Democrats livid over the cost of the National Nuclear Commission. If we don't spend the money to make them safe and stable, then we'll have to spend more down the line to repair or worse. This god dang nuclear program is blowing a hole in the budget, another senator said. We can't constantly keep borrowing money for all these sky-in-the-pie projects of yours, Mr. President. These nuclear plants are, will more than pay for themselves over the lifetime. 30, 40 years, Glenn replied. Lower power costs, less pollution, healthier people. We don't have to pay for Arabian or Persian oil. And the army is going to be stronger, and therefore America is going to be stronger for it. That's all well and good, Mr. President, the second senator said. But we have to worry about the money. And how are we going to borrow more, putting, piling on more debt to pay for all these plants? That's going to be on our children and grandchildren to pay. All so we can have some fancy power plants now. The president took a deep breath. I understand your concerns, gentlemen, and I'll keep them in mind. Thank you for your concerns. The Democrat senators glanced at each other and began to file out of the Oval Office. Sure, President Glenn had heard them, but was he actually listening? The future will be poor, but they will have fancy nuclear reactors. Goes further divided. Voters and the Southern Rockies will disapprove. I don't care. If you want to talk about budget, okay, let's talk about budget then, Senators. Look at the GDP cost for this. The greatest thing, 318 billion. Talk about the oil crisis, which we got to, we're trying to solve the oil crisis right now with the nuclear reactors, right? We got generous subsidies, employment subsidies, like we talked about in the last episode, as well as acceptable pensions and public health care. There's other things here, like cost things. Man, come on. Come on. You want to talk about budget? We'll talk about budget that way. But regardless, let's go for another focus. Recruiting Disney. We probably should have recruited Disney before we had all these events, but as much as we've tried to boil down the science of nuclear power for the average citizen, there are bottlenecks. Most Americans don't read Scientific American, and many viewers yawn and change the channel when they face an egghead on television. Selling a government project to the people has always been as much about familiar images and reliability or relatability as it has been about the actual facts at hand, and who or what is more familiar and reactable or relatable to the average American than Mickey Mouse. Cool. But not in my backyard. The National Nuclear Commission determined that the best places to build nuclear power plants are in the areas with small towns, farmland, and on the edges of major cities. The land is cheaper and easier to access and to provide new jobs in the areas that need them, however. Those underdeveloped areas also happen to be close to the iconic small towns of middle America and the sprawling suburbs that have re redefined American life since the end of the war, where a lot of well-educated white middle-class Americans live, and many of these small towns and suburbs across the U.S. are not really liking the fact that they are now going to be living next to a giant concrete monstrosity of cooling towers and giant reactors. The concerns are varied. The ugly buildings, the lower land values, the threat of radiation, the risk of meltdowns, the danger of nuclear waste, blocking further development, the fact that there is development, and just loud noises of construction tactics to oppose the construction of new reactors uh, are also innumerable. Protests at country or, country or town meetings, pickets at construction sites, vandalism of machinery, letters to newspapers calling for actions from state representatives or the local congressmen, the opposition to the NC NNC is coalescing into a new movement that is being called the Not In My Backyard or NIMBY. While there's much of the NIMBY movement as grassroots and local, there's been rumors that outside groups are providing funds and local support for these groups. And investigations by media outlets have traced the funding through a myriad of people and shell companies, and eventually to the source, America's big oil and gas companies. But these discoveries often buried in resulting in reporters that re or fired haven't dampened the movement at all. They are cave people, citizens against virtually everything. Voters in oil and gas producing states, as well as those home to reactors, disapprove. Whatever. It's only an election year, right? It's only an election year. Just give me just one moment. We still have about a month left to invest into the Aries program from the end of last episode, too. My apologies about that. I had to go double-check things because it sounded like something fell down. Maybe someone fell down, but oh well. So we're also right now increasing the budget. We spent some political power doing that just because to get a little bit more spending because $810 million is not going to be enough. It's just not. This is the first time we're doing the Aries project. we got to do it three more times if every single one is successful, which it actually should be fairly successful because we already have enough, a, good, a really good amount of base preparedness, supposedly, by doing all the other previous manned missions, which would be nice. Very, very nice. Going to get 0.35 political power a day. Not great, but hopefully we can improve that. Right now, our debt to, what was it, income to debt levels or something like that ratio? Deficit to income is 65%. Not bad, not bad. 
Oh wait, it says our annual GDP growth is 4.2%, choosing our SCOTUS nominee. At the moment, the Supreme Court is moderately conservative. Many in both the media and Congress are urging us to select a nominee who would provide some ideological balance. The Supreme Court is ostensibly supposed to be nonpartisan, but kept away from petty day-to-day -day politics. On the other hand, very few things in America are nonpartisan when you get right down to it. Picking a nominee who fights with their ideological outlook could ensure some real political victories down the line, yet, on the other hand, it could draw the ire of those who aren't staunch members of a voting base. So, which option should we go with, a liberal or conservative one? It's moderately conservative. We can make it even more conservative. Either way, we're going to get screwed over with this vote, probably, or who we choose. Uh, moderately conservative. I, I want to say we want to choose a liberal one for now. I think the last time we chose a conservative one, maybe? We chose a liberal one last time? I can't even remember at this point, man. Ooh, conservative, liberal. Mm. We can make it more conservative. So we'll make it more liberal, then. 162 billion up. Oh, 0.77. Okay. Because last time we also... Wait, it says annual growth, 3.10. Up here, though, it says 4.2. Uh, this it might not be updating? Maybe not? I don't know. I'll take the 4.2, though, back. I'll, I'll gladly take that. Brain technicians, siphon military funding. No, we good. We got a few days left for this. 74. I don't think there's any world conflicts going on right now, right? Oh, Anzian... Okay, Africa's on fire, but what else is new? So... Let's go ahead and do a next-gen try. We shall have it all. Nuclear technology is, by and large, dependent on a sec na single natural resource, uranium. The means for securing domination over our rivals in nuclear technology must start from seizing any and all natural deposits of this mineral or buying out all of our rivals. What we cannot have, we must ensure that other enemies cannot make use of either. Cool. Let's come down here. we got one day left. Uh, let's, let's wait for this one to get finished first. That'll be okay. All right. So we have 86% preparedness. That's not bad. We can prepare the rocket. We want at least 14%, so that's too much. Prepare the launch pad. Run diagnostic simulations. And then we'll launch it. Now, we saw this yesterday, that this is bugged at the time of this recording, but that's okay. The power, the appeal of the atom. Nuclear is a dirty word in American politics. The average American is completely uneducated on scientific matters, and this particular one casts a dark shadow over our politics. The atomic attack on Pearl Harbor and the tensions surrounding the Hawaiian Missile Crisis have left our population fearful of anything radioactive. And it's abundantly clear doubling down on our nuclear program is a political suicide in the current climate. Fortunately, the evidence is on our side, and we have the means to show it off to the public. One of our advisors has been in talks with the Walt Disney Company to start creating some informational materials to make sure people are being told the truth. We'll keep our own scientists and public relations officials involved to keep everything as accurate and educational as possible and make something that Americans of all ages will understand. The first decision we need to make is what to focus on. Do we target the Hawks and try to focus on our nuclear stockpile or do we discuss the potential power of nuclear? Nuclear energy. Deterrence is the first line of defense. Nuclear energy looks like it has a much greater benefit in, to the American people than nuclear weapons. Probably. So that's why we went with that option. If you read about nuclear bombs, like what is that going to do for me? With nuclear power, it might make things cheaper for the average American and keeping their attention as nuclear power becomes a popular energy alternative. We need to educate the populace on its importance. After all, many of our cities could be empowered by nuclear reactors within the next half century. Unfortunately, much of the country's population continues to hold tightly to old fossil fuels and damn power electricity. The burning of coal might continue adding to the already hastened demise of our ozone layer, but if we wish or switch to nuclear energy, we could be more conservative of the environment. The bright future of nuclear power all depends on the initial campaign. Our industry has decided to target kids with the newest campaign, seeing them as an up-and-coming generation. We must make decisions on where to focus the campaign to ensure children are educated. When we are making movies about nuclear reactors for kids, we don't want them to get bored and fall asleep. That would ruin the entire campaign. However, you show too much action and not enough information, that point of nuclear energy would also fall through. Should we focus on action to get the kids excited, or should we focus on education to make sure that we get our points across? But the future must be exciting. Uh, we need to educate kids so the kids will get the message. Let's go a movie about the future, because kids want to, they want action, you know? They don't want to be just talked at. That's what school's for, right? So if they're going to watch stuff on TV... A movie about the future must be exciting. I mean, they'll, get, they'll at least get some of the images. So they think, like, nuclear power, nuclear reactor in the back of their minds at all times, or things that could happen in the future, that's the most important thing. That, that has to be. Because that's what's going to help them drive, like, oh, we should do this, we should do that in the future. Remember what we saw when we were kids? Yeah, well, they invest in that. Even though if we don't fully understand it, that's okay. That's totally okay. And once again, we're at 0% approval rating. Great! And we do have a month until stuff. Uh, actually, I just realized. It's August 28th, 29th, 1974. Aren't we supposed to have elections? Hey, but like I said before, by the time you get to 1972, you can start seeing TNO kind of unravel in terms of development, and things, you know, had to get cut before we could really 
do stuff. Oh, come on. A missed opportunity. Excitement over education. Tonight we follow the adventures of Roger Cassidy, once a brave soldier in the U.S. Army, transformed into an all-American super soldier by secret government experiment. With the power of radioactive energy at his command, Cassidy is now the hero we need in the Atomic Age Captain Nuclear. Tonight's thrilling feature thro th shows our fearless hero face off against insidious plots of his arch-nemesis Wolfgang Atomar, Atomar, the dastardly fear of the fission. Who doesn't love a good patriotic hero? Captain Nuclear was a big hit with the kids, and Disney's already planning to have it distributed in theaters nationwide. Sadly, the parents didn't seem to feel the same way. Pitching this as an informational film may have been ill-advised, and there's some merit to the complaints. Even the children who could tell that much to their delight, Captain Nuclear's advanced government gadgets and amazing radioactive powers had no bearing on real life, and most of the parents were grumbling about the lack of educational value in the film. Are they really watching movies for educational access? I mean, watch some documentaries then. Unfortunately for us, these kids can't vote, and the parents seem to be lukewarm with the idea of supporting us in the future. It seems that we just ended up bankrolling Disney's next, next movie, and while it might endear us to the mouse and the children, it doesn't seem to have gained us any support for nuclear power. Captain Nuclear may have defeated At Atomar and his evil fascist plot against the city of nu Neutronburg, but that won't be saving the day for us. A missed opportunity? I don't care. This is for the future! Yeah, in the, in the, in the meantime, it's not great, but I'm thinking about the next generation. Which, too bad this doesn't go until 1990, but whatever. Man, if GMO goes all the way to the 1990s, that'd be insane. The amount of work that has to be put in for that would be nuts. The glowing star over Chicago, though. A Rockefeller and Metzenbaum sat across President Glenn as they stared intently at the television sets built into the Oval Office. The screen displayed images of a massive group gathered in front of the Dresden Generating Station, cheering and chanting and waving banners in support of nuclear power plant success. The TV sets clickered, suddenly clickered off with the President's remote. The President sat silent, gazing at the TV sets before returning to meet the eyes of his staff. Metzenbaum and Rockefeller both felt uneasy at the President's reaction to the uplifting news of the TV program as he seemed dreadfully upset by the news. Mr. President, is everything all right? Mr. Bone finally jumped in, breaking the silence of the room. Immediately, Glenn barked back at the man, Both of you, follow me now. The two men quickly followed Glenn, awaiting the news that could possibly have the typically gleeful president so perturbed after the great news. Finally, the president escorted the men to an inconspicuous car, making for the driver's seat, and hurtling off to the Maryland evening. The car ride was silent. Finally, Glenn parked on a hill, shrouded in darkness, but offering a beautiful look over the White House and several beautiful sights of the D.C. area. Get out, the president commanded. The two men did it as ordered, and Glenn walked, oh, walked them to the trunk. The president lifted the trunk door where the two men saw an ice chest, which the president took hold of and turned to the men. My one regret, the president said, is that I couldn't share a beer with the two men who made all this possible. Flight training made alcohol taste terrible for me. The two men looked shocked, disturbed, and honestly fearful as Glenn's stern expression melted into a warm smile and a roaring laugh as the men joined in by grabbing their beers and cheering the night away with a beautiful, starry sky above an incredible nation before them. Thank you both for everything. Wow, that's actually really cool. Uh, I thought this was going to be really negative. I thought this had the glowing star over Chicago. I mean, where was this? Uh, at the Dresden Generating Station? Yeah, just, okay, well, what happens, happens. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, how about we get a Boeing Vertol CK CK CH 46? Nice. All right, ten days left. Military, it doesn't even matter. So just, I guess we have it. We should have it all. And corner of the market. Forcing the arrival superpowers out of the nuclear business can't simply be done by restricting access to uranium alone. The myriad machines and media inputs necessary to build both nuclear reactors and nuclear weapons that are often commercially available, crisscrossing the world through the arteries of global trade on a daily basis. Cornering the market for these components will not only weaken our enemies, but also serve to empower ourselves if we can afford it. Oh, we can harm... We can harm the... Oh. Oh, shnikes. We can harm the uranium reserves of our enemies. A simple policy. John Glenn looked in the Oval Office. Longingly, gazingly out into the clear blue sky, skies beyond the thin pane of glass before him when a knock came at the door. Come in, he said. Two men in gray suits stepped inside the oblong room. Clark Clifford, Secretary of Defense, and Glenn Seaborg, Atomic Energy Com Commissioner. Gentlemen, said the President, what can I do for you today? Seaborg spoke first. We wanted to see you in person, Mr. President. We believe it is this meeting that takes place behind closed doors. When you first became Pontus, POTUS, said Clifford, you gave us a simple policy for a nuclear arsenal. Keep it expanding, keep buying the world's supply of uranium, and keep sabotaging the German and Japanese arsenals. Glenn scratched scratch his chin, and... And our uranium purchasing plan, while extraordinarily expensive, is growing along smoothly, said Seaborg. Uh, placing a manila folder on the president's desk. We, we just won't be able to hide it forever. Glenn sat down at his desk. Extremely expensive plans, almost certainly of being discovered. Slight chance of nuclear annihilation. What are we waiting for? Nice. So if we do end up getting, like, things going kaboom, obviously I'll do a fade in, fade out, and we'll reassess. Joint training. We're gonna need the money now. Launch it. It's 100%. We've invested half a billion into the program Dancing on the Stars. If you'd like to read this, go right ahead. And we got a total of... 40 political power. Oh, we can purchase uranium. Cost us 120 million per year. Our nuclear stockpile goes up. 
It's critical power. Oh, man. I I can't afford to do that right now. Glenn's nuclear commission? Whew. Good lord, son. Oh, man. Oh, man. That's a lot. How's the ratio looking now? Because we're still building some more civilian factories. 65.8%. No matter how many civilian factories we make, it's never enough. One, two, not bad. Come back over here. The rocket status. Hopefully it goes well. Joint testing program. I might go ahead and raise the spending cap. 200 million is not bad. Uh, getting 150 million is just better. Just, it's just cheaper. Without Senate elections. Oh, what's going to happen? Mission rewards? Great. 101 research points and 20 public support. Awesome. And the areas of program again. We lose 0.25 political power a day. God dang it, that sucks so much. So now we have 560 million. It's never enough. Never, ever, ever enough. According to the market, our yield must grow. Uh, denial of the enemy is not enough to win the war. Our own advancement of the nuclear sciences must match and overpace that of Germany and Japan if we are meant to conclusively overpower them in nuclear armaments. The development of ever stronger nuclear weapons demand even ever larger investments in our scientific and industrial base, a price well worth paying. Well, we'll see about that. I mean, it's going to take some time to get all this stuff done. I mean, my goodness. The cost has been so much. Civilian opposition to the National Nuclear Commission. Good thing is we don't have elections, right? Let's keep this open just so we can get to see this at all times. Well, the National Nuclear Commission was first proposed by the President John Glenn. The idea was that it would balance both military and civilian needs. After all, the armed forces need powerful weapons to protect America from similarly armed powers and cheap atomic power to wean America off of foreign oil supplies and provide a boost to the economy in general, a win-win for everyone. However, it's becoming clear that most of the money earmarked for the NNC is being spent on the military, and with vast amounts of money being spent on modernizing older weapons, designing new bombs, deploying more missiles, building more bombers, laying down new subs. However, of course, again, ordinary citizens' taxpayers are seeing the NNC not as a great economic panacea that would lower power bills and end the need for polluting power plants, burning oil, and coal. Complaints ranging from letters to the editor in newspapers across America to overloaded switchboards to the Capitol are increasing by the day. Polls are already showing that more and more people are turning against the Nuclear National Commission or National Nuclear Commission. Alienating ordinary citizens and taxpayers is what is already proving to be an expensive and controversial program is really bad news. The president's opponents in Congress are in the media already clamoring to scale back the National Nuclear Pro Commission, reprioritizing its objectives, or even scrap it altogether. President and Glenn is going to have to fix this, and soon or else one of his great projects will fall apart. You can never make anyone happy, can you? And this is why someone said, way before we started doing this, down this nuclear path, that we are not going to be able to do stuff. Like, oh crap. Operation Glowing Dragon to be present, presented to the JCS and POTS, the president. Operation Glowing Dragon, the current plan to seize control of the uranium resources in Africa, has been greenlit. At the present time, there exact. There's exist two possible methods of the operation's execution. A small, semi-covert force that would give the U.S. military plausible deniability. Troop involvement was mostly drawn from special forces operations and elite units. These soldiers would not fly American colors, nor would they use standard American-issue weapons. They would seize large uranium deposits under the guise of a mercenary role, instead of extraction and exportation, and send the materials back to the U.S. However, should our involvement be revealed to the public, it would likely become a scandal of untold proportions, thus it is not recommended. An official American intervention in Africa under the guise of restoring law and order to the former OFM protectorates. This action, while controversial at first, is likely to be more beneficial in the long run, due to a reduced need for intermediaries and secrecy. From Schwarzkopf, American United States Africa Command. Quite as possible. Uh, secrecy is overrated. Bring in the heavy artillery to South Africa should really start pulling their own weight down there. Uh, we could maybe do that. How much do they like us? This looks kind of interesting. Oh, they like us a lot. Keep this as quiet as possible. Hmm. If this goes poorly, then I will do a fade in, fade out because I'm tired of having things not go our way sometimes. Secrecy is overrated. Bring in the heavy artillery. We could go to war with these guys. Well, let's... Mm. We've already been found out once. Let's get South Africa on board. Let's see what happens. Hey! Only 1.5 trillion. That's all. Hey, 66.3. Not bad, not bad. Keep making more civilian factories if that helps out at all. Not bad, not bad. Keep this open. We still have a couple months left to go with this. That's fine. Joint testings program. Oof. Could still use more money. Oh, gotta wait for this is done. Just gotta wait. I, like I said before, I really wish there was things we could do with research points because it just doesn't make any sense why we can't do anything with it. Oh, we can purchase more stuff. Sabotage Chinese mines. Decrease Chinese nuclear stockpile by a substantial amount. Our operatives will have to act inside their backyard. 
False flag on Japanese. Oh my goodness. Strike German. Oh my gosh. Wait, German, strike German uranium facilities. Effect when selected. This will help decrease Japan's nuclear stockpile by a substantial amount. Um. Okay. That doesn't make a lot of sense, but I guess we'll roll with it. Why not? I, we can do one. We'll do one here. Strike German, Chinese mines, cost of 72 million, 54 million. Oh, if this goes poorly. Oh, man. Well, we could try it. Why not? And we do lose some political power, 0.26 every day, but we're waiting for the program to keep going. Cool. Just don't screw it up. Please, 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 please. Top secret glowing dragon after action report abridged. Oh, I missed it. Cool. Over the course of the past several weeks, American forces covert and otherwise have entered the jungles of the Congo Basin and seized several areas that are known to have uranium deposits as well as other valuable minerals and resources. Due to excessive use of helicopters and reconnaissance aircraft, most high-value targets were seized within a day. More fortified or remote islands fell within a week. At the present time, the U.S. wields strong control over the Shinkolobwe, also known as Hermansville, mine, as well as a looser hold upon the surrounding Katanga re region. Resource extraction is currently being initiated, and rail lines to South Africa are being set up so that, such that the resources may be exported back to the U.S. Forces of the 1st Marine Division and the 101st Airborne Division to attack their mine as the first major target in the region, coming under heavy fire from what would later confirm to be soldiers of the German SS, presumably left over from the fall of the Reich's commissariats in Africa. Some officers have conjectured that the Germans were exporting the uranium from the mine back to Europe, but most experts of the USAFRICOM disagree. The Germans were put under heavy fire by Marines arriving in gunboats while airborne flank using helicopters, leading to many of the remaining Germans being killed or fleeing. As far as is currently known, casualties from this initial strike number 40 Americans killed or wounded, with over 300 Germans killed. Following the success of the attack on, on the region, the Marines spread out through the jungle in pursuit of the retreating SS elements, meeting none. Meanwhile, the 101st, assisted by the Navy, uh, recon jets, attacked several surrounding villages and towns, mostly, no, most notably Likasi, also known as Jadoshta. In the following week, American forces encountered minimal resistance from local warlord groups and German remnants. Total casualties at this time amount to 104 uh, wounded Americans, with 27 killed. Warlord and German casualties are known, would presumably be significantly higher. From Schwarzkopf, excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Oh my goodness, this is, this is insane what we're doing. Why? Why would we be doing this? I mean, are, it's going up more, but at what cost? I mean, we already have an apocalyptic stockpile of nuclear weapons. It's only 74. This isn't even the 80s. Oh, man. Oh. Oh, look at all the ciphers I did. <laughs> I totally forgot we were doing all this stuff earlier. Oh, we, even, we didn't even finish. Well, we're not going to finish. But, oh my goodness, look at all this. The ones we did. I guess we'll do all these nations now. Wow, that's how long we've been playing this campaign. We got all those nations done at the same time, including Germany. Holy crud. Alright. How's this looking? A month left. Joint testing programs. Fine, it's fine, fine. And we have 100 political power point, 26 a day. Not ideal, but it is what it is. Our yield will grow in the next gen triad. The effectiveness of our nuclear arsenal depends on the retention of multiple means of delivering a salvo of atomic fire on our enemies. Uh, by land, by sea, and by air, continued development of these three legs of the nuclear triad will be essential and convenient convincing our enemies that they have no hope of winning a nuclear conflict with the U.S., and that their best interests lie at the negotiating table on our terms. Oh, okay, so a bridge. Yesterday, a heavily anticipated out counterattack against a German and African warlord that nearly forced American forces to abandon the Katana region. Katanga region. American forces reclaimed the town of Lakasi, as well as the vital mine of Shinkolobue. Involved units include a majority of the forces of the 1st Marine Division, supported by elements of the 101st Airborne and Air Wings of the USS Navy 6th Fleet. The attack utterly shattered the thin alliance between the warlords, revolutionaries, and the SS forces under Heinz Barth, sending them retreating back into the jungles with significant casualties. The attack was centered around the village of Panda, just to the south of Lakasi, where American close air support drew SS units out of their entrenched positions with the use of napalm and white phosphorus munitions. Once drawn out, helicopter elements of the 101st Airborne surrounded and destroyed the fleeing German units. This then cleared the way for the several brigades of the 1st Marine Division to cross the Panda River and march on Lakasi from the south and southwest. Meanwhile, the remainder of the 2nd Battalion, 4th Marine, supported by reinforcements of the 1st Battalion and close air support, advanced on the Lakasi from the east. The Africans, likely having seen the destruction wrecked upon the SS, broke formation and retreated to the north only after a few minutes of combat. Despite the temporary setback, it appears much more important. Uh, much of the important mining equipment is still intact. After executing a few search and destroy missions to hunt down the last of the SS that escaped the bombing of Panda, uh, the mines should be ready to export their uranium resources back to the U.S. Run, you goddamn bastards. Uster Uncle Sam's coming and knocking. Public support will increase. Well, they shouldn't know what's going on. Should they? Cool. 
more political power, great. I'm more invested in this stuff. I mean, this stuff is okay. Strength German, oh, please don't, please don't. Please don't do this. Please don't kill us off. Power of the gods. Oh boy. Prison Glenn strode along the broad spiral staircase that surrounded the new missile silos main chambers. The catwalk was purely for inspecting the missiles. Should anyone be in here with a rocket launch? My god help their immortal soul. Regardless, barring the entry of or the start of total nuclear war, no missiles would be, would be launched. Today, Glenn so stood, admiring the massive cylindrical creation of aluminum and steel with a heart of plutonium. It was awe-inspiring, the power of gods sitting right before him with a judicious ability to wipe the face of the earth clean. However, Unless pushed to the edge, America would never fire first. It had all these purely for defense, of course, insurance, in case the worst came to pass. He turned to the director of the new facility, a man named William Bauman. What's the range of this missile? The Minuteman 3 claims a range of about 13,000 kilometers, he said. That's roughly 8,000 miles and farther away than any other missile currently in the service on the planet. Incredible, the president said. And they don't even know we have it. Krauts and Nips would be shaking in their boots if they all knew the stuff we got up to. America needs a strong nuclear defense, and I'm glad my administration was able to help provide for it. Speak softly and carry a massive stick. Cool. So just don't look at the depth. Oh, let's see. Seven meter. Funny. We'll wait. We'll wait. Hmm. My apologies. I was drinking some coffee. All right. All right. All right. Come on, strike German uranium thingies facilities. And, second letter funny, no joint training, yep. Come on, this takes so long. Oh, let's see what happens. Purchase South African Uranium? Yeah, let's definitely do that, just so we can help them out. Yeah, we have enough political power to do so, I think that's okay. Come on, come on, come on, invest into the Ares program. Get us another event, please. It's so slow. Let's look at the gr blue sea here. Ooh, nice blue. Debts, 66.8. We're doing the best we can. Oh, we finished some civilian factories, huh? In the red. Oh boy, that does not sound good. So, Pentagon announces billions in uranium contracts. Deficit revised further. The Wall Street Journal blared on its front page. President Glenn had seen the faces of RD senators on the Finance Committee grow pallid on TV as the MPP torched the administration's lack of fiscal restraint. Suddenly, the proverbial man in the street, Glenn's rocket ships ain't doing jack squat. It's not rocket ships, Glenn muttered. They're nuclear rocket ships. The Secretary of the Treasury, Jacob Javits, caught as he raised his hand. They've got a point, Mr. President. We've revised the budget estimates three times over the last fiscal year, and there's not enough red ink in Washington. President Glenn pinches no stop. We've gone over this and we're not cutting the nuclear program. We're trying to win the Cold War for God's sakes. We're not doing that if we fall behind on the atomic curve. A vein twitched on Javits' face, leading Pre Vice President Gore to intercede. Honestly, John, do you really want to explain another budget correction to the Senate? The MPP is going to have a field day. President Glenn drummed his fingers on the table, running the numbers. Research costs were open-ended. Weapon costs could come down, but only over time. The le That left will lean on the uranium mines. Cool. And I will be right back. All right, my friends, sorry about that, but now we have done the joint testing programs and we are ready to do or launch Ares program two. We have 86% prepared. Let's go ahead and do the normal one, which we get 15% more preparedness or just 15 more preparedness and then launch the missile because doing this would be a waste of time for the Gemini Mark II suit, but that's okay. Hopefully when we sabotage enemy mines and stuff like that, nothing bad happens. We have 1% approval rating from the public. How great. All right, next up, a next-gen targeting solution. Circular arrow probable. The bane of any ballistics targeting exercise. While some would argue... Oh, hello. Oh, we're not done yet, game. It's 74. We're going to continue anyways. No further score will be recorded from this point onward. I don't really care. That's not, that's not the end of the campaign yet. But... Some would argue that accuracy is overrated when a weapon's explosive force is measured in megatons of TNT. Accuracy will forever and always be a crucial indicator of a weapon system's maturity. The more missiles we can accurately deliver on target, the more confident we can end a conflict with a single stroke. The supercomputers of NASA already used to calculate rocket trajectories can easily be repurposed for the work of nuclear warfare. Nice. Very, very nice. Advanced destroyer hulls, you say? How about we get some California class? Advanced cruisers. The game of chicken. That's not the price we discussed a week ago, you jerk. Uh, Glenn roared into the headset. Tell me why the asking price for a pound of uranium doubled overnight. Mr. President, we're not trying to be unreasonable. The voice on the line replied neutrally in a lang languid drawl. But this is business, and I'll tell you right now that these price cuts you requested can't be done immediately. None of that explains the price hikes. Get to the point, Glenn snapped. Well, if you want to work towards getting these costs down, then we're going to need larger mines and more modern refining techniques. The voice on the line chuckled without a hint of warmth. And with the budget deficits you've been printing, you figured you wouldn't be able to upwork federal joint venture. So instead of asking how we can figure this out, you're exhorting the government. Real generous of you, Glenn, Glenn replied venomously. The voice on the line hardened. You need us, Mr. President. You're swimming in the red, and we represent 
all the producers of uranium in North America. You can't win. Don't bluff on a losing hand. You work for me now. All right, let's talk. Ooh, the, the public is unlikely to support future projects if nothing is done to address the costs. Well, I mean, they can't really... What else can they do to us? They've already had, like, several ventures into our, like, budget and stuff, so... And this is not what's driving, like, costs, so... False flag? We're gonna sabotage Chinese mines first. But... As, we, oh, as we've discussed before, it's not the space program cost that's really driving things up, but it does reality. Commodities... Ooh! Uh, breathe a sigh of relief as the Glenn administration explicitly denied recent rumors that it would be seizing uranium mines for the government nuclear programs. The stock price of major mining companies rallied on expectations of record revenues while treasury yields spiked on expectations of yet another budget correction. Analysts presented a, mixture, a mixed picture of the latest decision, reached after talks between mining giants and the government were on the verge of breakdown. While economists have welcomed the non-interference by the government inter federal government in the commodities markets, political analysis have warned that differences will be reflected in the increased budget figures, necessitating higher tax rates, and even as the Glenn administration continues to struggle to explain its fiscal policies to Congress. NPP leaders will quickly react to the news, with leadership figures commenting, commenting that, for all the RDs talk about the party being responsible governance, the dollar figures being spent by the Glenn administration are nothing short of alarming, especially when they are being spent on unproven, untested boondoggles. Any new nuclear spending will cost us public support from now on, it doesn't matter. Hey, look! A uh, larger nuclear stockpile, if you want to read about that, go right ahead, but none shall threaten us again. I mean, we're already maxed out in terms of development, so... And we can continue improving it, but it doesn't do anything for us, so... Cool, and get some more ships. The Nimitz class. Ah, yes, advanced carriers are very nice. Uh, 175 billion in terms of annual deficit. Eh. Hey, 66.9, not bad, that's not bad. We have 1.2 trillion in GDP, that's not bad either. Yeah, I really wish there was a way we could lessen the oil crisis. If we could do that, that'd be so nice. And honestly, with the oil crisis, I mean, we could kind of still see the oil crisis. Since Italy took over this area, and Imperial City of Iran is doing better now, like, I know it's not in the mod yet, but if that happens, we should be able to maybe eventually open up channels to Italy, seeing as, like, hey, you stabilize the price of oil, right? How about we work together a little bit? I don't know. The blood out the sun. Jack sat down on the couch with an ice-cold bottle of suds, ready to enjoy an hour or two of TV before heading back outside for more yard work. He clicked on the TV, a small antenna catching only the most powerful signals over the air. The display flickered alive, showing a black and white broadcast of what appeared to be President John Glenn examining some variety of bomber aircraft. Several of them flew overhead while the President himself admired a stationary one on the ground. The President and his entourage then moved over to the side of the runway they were standing on. So John Glenn turned to face a reporter who was slightly out of frame. Why do you think that this new bomber is so revolutionary, Mr. President? Asked the reporter in that half condescending, weirdly in intonated reporter voice that they always used. Well, for starters, it's easily the fastest bomber in the world. The B-51 Lancer can reach a top speed of over 1.25 times the speed of sound. You know, a lot of people ask me why we don't just replace bombers completely with missiles. Well, for I, for one, if we have a false alarm and we need to send out bombers, we can always bring them back. With a missile, once you launch it, it's not coming back. A pilot has discretion as well. He's able to gauge the, the value of the target, whether it's a threat or not, whether it's worth hitting. In short, I think that the new B-51 Lancer is going to be greatly strengthening our nuclear triad. It's simply a fine new jet. Now let's watch one give us a little show, eh? With that, the president turned and gave a thumbs up, presumably, to the pilot of the bomber he was examining just moments ago. The massive jet fired up its engines and promptly threw the president on his butt, rolling backwards like an armadillo and its aides following suit, scrambling over to help, but only being knocked down themselves. Well, gosh dang, muttered Jack, there must be a hell of a jet to knock the president on his butt. Please tell me that wasn't live. Cool. Keep pushing for more progress. It's only 75. We can do more. We can do better. Actually, how's everything else improving? The poverty rate is still actually going up more and more by two and a half a month. That's not bad. If we can get down to five to ten percent poverty rate or whatever it is, that will help us out a little bit more. But we control the power. There are those who say that the value of the nuclear arsenal of a nation's deterrent starts and ends with its mere existence by simply retaining the ability to vaporize the world in a hundred times over with the press of a button. President Glenn disagrees. The atom is not like a god, terrible and vengeful. It is a tool and a tool has many uses. If we only would employ it as such in our negotiations with Germany and Japan. We'll go more unified, nuclear stock bar goes up, stability and war support, all the good things in life. And let's launch Ares 2. Don't want to forget about doing that. Dancing among the stars, forward onto heaven. Great. Rocket status. And we're sabotaging Chinese mines. Please, if we get discovered, that'll not be very good. Oh no. In which we'll probably eventually purchase some stuff from Australia and Canada and... Oh, wait. Heightened suspicions. Ooh. Wait, what? Hmm. 
will fail if Glenn clear timer. Wait, what does that mean? Does that mean if I do it again, they'll probably find out what we've been up to? Hmm. Purchase, erase, oh, we need to erase our tracks. Huh, cost us basically 50 political power. Why can't we do that? Glenn clear timer. So if we don't do anything for now, that'd be, okay, mission rewards, great. Do we need more support? Oh, we need more money now, god dang it. Oh, if we, oh, yeah. We need 141 million more dollars. I don't want to spend the political power for this, but we got to right now. Because it just takes way too long to get this stuff done. So, we're not going to have any more false flag attacks. That'll be okay. Or just any more stuff like that. So, we got to wait. Uh, you know what? I don't ever research this stuff. Let's go with IVs. Why not? Because we can, right? Because we can. We control the power. Anything else here that we should really be aware of? Besides lag. <laughs> Siphon military funding, increase of budgets. No, not really anything here. Cool. Early warning system Rejevic. Uh, not bad. To the land down under. Sure. Australia, Liberty's last ocean in the Western Pacific, has lived under the constant threat of Japanese invasion for over 20 years. It's time that the extension of the OFN nuclear umbrella be made that much more tangible for our Aussie allies. To provide them with the air bases and tactical missiles that will tip the scales in their favor against the numerically superior Japanese adversary. Cool. Actually, let's see first. So if we don't do anything, we should be do okay, and then we can hopefully erase our tracks. Sab oh, we can sabotage the mines again now. A letter from the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Mr. President, I received a letter from Joint Chiefs of Staff today, and well, you see for yourself. The Secretary of Defense, Cyrus Vance, said, handing over a several-page-long letter to John Glenn. Glenn looked at the letter began to read, frowning as he did so. So they are angry that we are focusing on nukes, but this is what they wanted. But they were throwing a tantrum at the Pentagon because we aren't spending as much on everything else. Tanks, planes, aircraft carriers, basically the non-nuclear stuff, the Secretary Vance sighed. You can't just make the children with stars on their shoulders happy, it seems. Give them nukes, they want tanks. Give them tanks, they want helicopters. And on and on it goes. Yeah, we'll have their own idea of what will win the next war and what won't, and that's different from the next guy, Glenn said, setting down the letter and rubbing his forehead. So they want a bit of everything. Secretary Vance nodded, but we can't do that. Congress will throw a con conniption if we ask them for more money, unless we take it from the NNC, but that will also the construction of new reactors. Glenn turned his big chair around to look out the window towards the Rose Garden, contemplating his options. Ask Congress for more funds for the military, which they won't like. Diverting funds from the National Nuclear Commission, which would slow down the construction and development of new reactors or atomic projects. Or tell the Joint Chiefs of Staff off, off, making them even grumpier than they are now. Days like these where Glenn wished he was still an astronaut. Ooh, has more than enough money? Who are they to go against a commander-in-chief? We can trim a bit of the nuclear program. The rate at which... We will greatly reduce nuclear weapons. A new military spending bill will be introduced to the Senate. We have two months to pass it. No. No. We already have enough money. There's nothing I can do. It's out of my hands. If they don't support me, I don't care. I'm still their, their president, the commander-in-chief, so... Yeah, heightened suspicion. We can't do that right now. Cut of the program. Staff and military funding. Oh, I don't mind doing that again. We can only get 0.35 a day. 67.7. 67 That's not bad. Our telephones. Topeka. Oh, Wichita. Missouri's weird. Look at that. Missouri Springfield's down here, which I've been to. Jefferson City. Haven't been to. Kansas City. Kansas City. St. Joseph, huh? Oh, St. Joseph's... Joseph's? Joseph is in Missouri, huh? We learn new things every day. Rumblings for the Pentagon. Words in the Pentagon. Spread quickly. In the world's largest office building with over 20,000 people working in it, news, rumors, and gossip always spreads fast, but the news that there will be no additional funding to the Department of Defense due to a National Nuclear Commission program spread like wildfire. Admirals and generals are like we're apologetic or popolitic at the thought of their pet projects that they will surely guarantee victory in whatever future battles America will face and was still not getting the funding they needed. Instead, it was more nukes, missiles to launch the nukes, bombers to drop the nukes, and submarines to sneak in with and around with nukes. Because of the problem with nukes is that it's a wrecking ball, I and mean, sometimes all you need is a fly swatter. There's a talk amongst that the President Glenn, a war hero, fighter, pilot, and brave astronaut, had forgotten where he came from, and in his time in the White House, he meant it. He had lost sight of what was truly important in safeguarding America. However, everyone in the building, from the office workers that dealt with the draft paperwork to the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff knew that they can't reveal their displeasure at not getting more money. Congress won't, would roast them alive in committee meetings for wanting this money, and the public would not be too keen on having to foot the bill on yet more experimental projects. So, while the tempers are high, there'll still be only a minor ripple that escapes the Pentagon, but that doesn't mean that soldiers, sailors, and airmen are happy. Even the Secretary of Defense and the President knows himself that the morale is growing weaker as appreciation for the military seems to be lagging behind. Sure, the current budget is all well and good, and the equipment that soldiers have is still top of the line and better than anything else in the world, but it could always be better. I guess our double-barreled Hoover tank, or hover tank, will be delayed again. Double-barreled tank, that sounds amazing. 
Let's go and grab this. We're going to get more money immediately. Because we're not going to have enough money later on, so. We got to do what we got to do right now. And watch the deck increase. Not bad. Not bad. Ooh, bring in technicians. Yeah, that's okay. That is a okay. 38 days, and the land down under. Nuclear submarine skunk works. Cost will rise. Nuclear. Ooh, nuclear ice. I like that idea. But let's do this one. The Pacific Ocean is vast and almost impossibly deep in areas. Perfect cover for a new fleet of ballistic missile submarines, waiting for the signal to deliver atomic retribution against a Japanese enemy. But the Japanese, with a presence from Hawaii to the former East Indies, will doubtlessly be vigilant against any intrusion by our silent service. The underseas arms race is on. Our submarines must be engineered for victory. Hopefully we can get this one done soon, and give us a couple more days, and we shall be there. Come on. There we go. Go. Cool, cool, cool. How's this looking? 25 more days. That's fine. 42 more days. That's fine. So be it. That gives us time to get more political power. Smart academic base towards the future. If you want to read this, go right ahead. So we replace secondary schooling with tertiary schooling, which is... Okay. Oh my goodness. Ooh, Australian nuclear silos of success. Over the past several weeks, it has come to light that the U.S. government has been placing nuclear weapons in Australia, notably in the Northern Territory and Western Australia. Contrary to what much of the American public anticipated, the Australians seem to be so highly support the action, and with the Australian Prime Minister claiming it makes both North America and Australia a safer place to be. A large minority of the Australian population, however, has taken to the streets in protest, believing that by, by having American nuclear weapons on their soil, they're simply making their homeland a target. Back here in the States, however, the reaction has been decidedly less cordial. In major several cities across the nation, thousands of protesters are calling for the removal of nuclear weapons from Australia. A rising star of the anti-nuclear movement, Randall Forsberg, had this to say, I don't believe that putting nuclear weapons in that country is helping to keep anyone safe. Not the Australians, not a government, not us. All the cheese is pushing one step closer to another Hawaiian missile crisis. Secretary of Defense Clark Clifford and the Atomic Energy Commissioner Glenn Seaborg have dismissed such claims without further elaboration. As, as of yet, the President has not made himself available for comment on the situation. With all this trouble, one has asked with the question, how does this make the average American safer? God dang hippies. And, of course, the base, of course. And uh, what I was going to say is that, look at... Well, you know what? Let's restart the resume, uh, resume battleship development. R look at Russia. The Kazakhstan... The Kazakh Soviet Social Republic is doing a great job. Men must be out of manpower by now, right? No, he's not. These guys have even more. The Ural the military district is there. How is this war still going on? It's 75. I thought the conflicts were done. How is men losing? I don't think I've ever seen this. And you know what? At least we can watch something burn. Besides nuclear waste. Wow. That is nuts to see this. Man, oh man. Oof. That is nuts. I've never seen the Kazakhs do that well. How many divisions do they have here? 64 versus 5. Wow. Versus 22 versus 54. I don't know. Man, this is... This is a weird time, I'm not going to lie. This is very weird. Cool. And we did that one. Oh, look at this. 70s missile cruiser. Very cool. Alright, we should be able to do this very soon. Five days left. Four days. Three. Two-ish. Come on, come on, come on. We only have a lot in debt, that's all. 183 annual deficit. Not bad. Are we actually building anything more? We still are, that's good. And 86% diagnostics again. And Ares 3 will be launched, which will be a great thing. Advanced Ellie Submarinos. Cool. Super Cobras. Super, super Cobras. Very, very nice. <laughs> There's no point in even cut this. You saved basically nothing. <laughs> basically nothing, but we keep slashing it. Only almost roughly 2 trillion in debt. That's all. Just 2 trillion. That's okay, 68.4% deficit income. We still got time. We can get another... Wow, okay. So many people have are politically connected, but Braxton, I guess you're it. Nuclear submarine skunk works. Early weapons station, warning station, Rejevik. To boldly make a nuclear force a centerpiece of American strategy requires that we protect ourselves against any German or Japanese attempt to disarm or disrupt our nuclear arsenal. Early warning and where possible surgical strikes must be the centerpiece of any such effort. In Iceland, the closest OFN territory to continental Europe, is ideally located to the host of facilities needed to achieve the objective. We will draw plans to base new over the horizon radars and hardened air bases in Iceland. The tip of the spear against the Unity Pact and the German menace. Beautiful. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We got a couple months left. 
Uh, well, I'll be honest here at this point. What we're gonna do is kind of hang out still. Hang out a little bit more. I want to see a few more focuses before we like do this final project, the Eagles Land, which I really, really want to do. But I think I'm gonna do some of this off screen just because it's eating up a lot of my time. Recording all these videos is eating up honestly too much of my time at the time of this recording. So I'm gonna do some of this off screen and just push through this as fast as possible. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate that I have to do that, but this whole Glenn thing, it's going a bit too slow, maybe for me at least. I don't know. Something like that. 500 of our 76 million budget into that program. Woof! That is so much. 0.48. Not bad. Upgrade to the Mark suit. So be it, so be it. Oh, yes. Also, how's this going along? The suspicion is 41 days. That's not bad. Eraser tracks. We definitely need to do that too. But we gotta get more money. Hopefully, when we have a successful Ares launch, that we can get some more more political power, hopefully 40 at least more political power so we can get more money, so we can do some more joint trading, trading, training, which would be good, which would be very, 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 very good. Actually, how close are we? We're 14 days for the two weeks left. That's not bad. We can bring in more technicians, but that's okay. And I think, does anyone have a focus tree that's still going on? I really doubt it. Shana might though, actually. No, nope, even they're done. Japan, I'm sure, is done as well, yeah. Italy, I'm pretty sure, is done. Yes, they are. Italian Egypt. South Africa. Oh, yeah, we can check this, too. Oh, let's look, look at this. Factories, huh? Let's keep an eye on this as well. Good. Let's see. Population-wise, Empire of Japan, we're still third. The Republic of India's not doing too bad. China's gone to number four. Not bad, not bad, not bad. Factory-wise, we are leading the world by a large amount. A lot of places have 2,000 political power. A lot of places don't have a lot of war support. Stability-wise, we're third. Not bad, not bad. Ideology, country, research slots. Ooh, don't, don't lag it too much, Mr. Mocha Lover. And we're almost there. And this is, oh, it's gonna take some more time. That's fine. Just launch it. Launch that sucker. Three, two, one. Come on, come on. God, TNO, like, lags so hard sometimes. I swear to God, man. It's too much. Too much sometimes. Launch Ares 3. Immediately launch it. 100% good enough. And... Dancing Among the Stars again. 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 Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. We can sabotage mines, but we're going to wait till this is done and then erase our tracks. Early warning station Rejevik. And nuclear Iceland. The Hawaiian missile crisis proved to be one thing above all else. The immediate presence of a nuclear threat has the potential to bring any power to a negotiating table. If a nation perceives that we are the, that there is a new threat in the backyard, they will seek to address it, preferably without triggering doomsday. And fortunately, the U.S. has just place has has just a place for such a threat to be established, Iceland. Across the archipelago, the bases that make up U.S. forces, Iceland, we've already seen a large number of nuclear-capable B-58s and B-52s ready to go at a moment's notice, of course. By constructing new missile silos for new MRBMs and ICBMs, a signal would be sent. Planes and crews may come and go, but silos are permanent. It would remind Germans that we have the capability to strike fast and strike hard. Such a gamble would surely bring them to the table and halt their madness. And if we try to do anything, well, they'll be closer, we'll be closer to them than ever before. But we're going to end today's episode there because... I'm going to be doing a lot of this off-screen, honestly, and the next episode, I promise, will be the final one, because this is just, to me at least, this is just dragging on and on and on, but I hope you enjoyed today's episode nonetheless. If you did, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow, when eventually, we will have the Eagles landed and a, hopefully a fragile piece. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day!